compelling questions, right? Who, who, is, who is the greatest of all time, and uh, what did he or she do to get there? Um, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but right now, culturally, we're kind of in a season of asking that question, who is the greatest of all time? Who's the GOAT, right? If you watch ESPN, who's the GOAT? Who's the greatest of all time? I don't know if you know this or not, uh, but there's this guy named Tom Brady that, that a couple months ago won his not first, second, third, fourth, or fifth Super Bowl. He won his sixth Super Bowl, solidifying him as one of the most hated men in America, right? <laughs> you hate Tom Brady. Why, why do you hate him? You don't hate him because he's bad at football. You hate him because he's so great, right? He's so good. How does he do it? I just don't know. Around this time, every year, you know, it's the end of the NBA season, so we're starting to hear arguments about, you know, who's better than MJ, and no one's better than MJ, but people like to say that certain people are, you know, but we start arguing all this, but who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? And, and we like to talk about all kinds, not just athleticism. I mean, the greatest scientist, the greatest thinker, the greatest artist or musician. Who is the greatest? Who is the most legendary, right? Like untouchable, the greatest of all time, the goat in whatever, whatever form we're talking about. Um, and, and this morning... We're going to be looking at what a guy named Paul says about who is the greatest of all time. Not, not, just, not just in one field, like overall greatest of all time. Like who is the greatest? And he would say what those that in here follow Jesus would say. And that's this, that Jesus was the greatest of all time. He is the greatest man that's ever walked the earth, period. Jesus is in a league of his own. And all the Christians in the room would heartily say, amen, right? We, we believe that. We believe that because of who he is. But I realize that not everybody in here is there. Not, not, not everyone in here believes necessarily that Jesus rose from the dead like I do or like, like believers in here do. But here's one thing that's really interesting. I found this last week. I found this chart, or it's, and it's from a statistical study that came out in 2015. It was done in 2014. It came out in 2015. And I think we have it. Can we throw it on the screens? It shows... That, that in this room right now, 92% of you, 92% of Americans believe that Jesus was a real person that lived. So, so 92% of you, and you kind of see like the breakdown of, of generations, us millennials, we went and, you know, we're lower than everyone else, but that's, we just like to mess with the curve. But, but, but we see this at 92%, 92% of in this room, more than 9 out of 10 of you, would agree that Jesus is a real or was a real person. He really lived. He was a real historical figure that really influenced the Middle East and still really has influence on those crazy Christians that still live today. He was really a person. But what's interesting is as you start reading this study more in depth, and you can go find it, it's through Barna, the Barna Research Group. What's interesting is the more you read about the study, once you get beyond Jesus was a real historical person, the 92% drops tremendously. Lots of people think that Jesus is a lot of different things. And so here, here's the question that I want to ask today that I'm hoping we see Paul answer for us in Scripture, at least for those that would claim to follow Jesus. It's this, who do you believe that Jesus is? You personally, where you're sitting right now, who do you believe that Jesus is? Not who does your brother believe that Jesus is, or your sister, or your mom, or your dad, or your grandmother that drug you to church every Sunday, or beat you if you didn't go. Not them. Who, who do you believe that Jesus is? And as we're processing through that question, we're going we're gonna to be walking through a book called Colossians. So if you have your Bibles in whatever way you carry them, we go ahead and grab them with me and open them to the book of Colossians, the book of Colossians. Now as you're turning there, the book of Colossians actually wasn't originally a book. It was a letter written by a church planter to a little fledgling church plant in kind of a suburban city in what is now modern day Turkey. It was written by this guy named Paul. Now, Paul was not the church guy. In fact, in, in Paul's high school yearbook, he was voted most likely to never attend church ever. He hated Christians. 
He hated Christians. His job was to round up Christians and throw them in jail. He wanted to stamp it out because he believed that it was a cult that was ruining his Jewish faith and his Jewish heritage. But then one day, he's got arrest warrants for hundreds of people and he's going down a road. And he has this miraculous experience. And Paul doesn't only just make a 180 turn, he becomes the greatest advocate of Christianity that this world has ever known outside of Jesus Christ. I mean, he wrote half the New Testament. He expanded the gospel to the entire known world of the time. He did incredible things, which here's a little nugget. This is for free today. I want you to see this. If God could use Paul and these incredible, the guy that was killing Christians, if God could use him, God can use you. He can use you. And we believe this. We believe that God has a plan for everyone. And God can use you. But, but this is Paul. Paul's writing this letter to a church in a city called Colossae, which is where we get Colossians. It's kind of like if he was writing to us, he'd be writing to Houstonians or Baytonians or Mont Bellevueans or Crosbyites, you know, or whatever it is. So, so that's, that's where we get the, the word Colossians from, and, and this is what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. You can read with me in your Bibles, or you can follow with me on the screens. These, this is what Paul's writing to them. He says this. He says he, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him... All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Paul comes out swinging in this text with some pretty colossal claims about who Jesus is. Jesus says, or Paul says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The image that he says, hey, you want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Do you want to know what God cares about? Look and see what Jesus cares about. Do you want to know how you should live your life? What is the purpose of your life? How you should live your life? Follow Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's pretty crazy. He goes on, though, and he says, not only is he the image of the invisible God, he's the firstborn of all creation. In other words, before anything was created, Jesus was there. We have this English word. That, that speaks of this. It's eternal. We believe that Jesus was eternal. Lots of times Christians in the room, when you hear eternal, you think of like after death, like forever later, like not having an end. But the word eternal not only means it doesn't have an end, it also has a beginning, which separates Jesus from all of us, because here's one thing I know for certain for everyone in here. 100% of people in here have an end. I'm sorry to tell you. All of us, 100% of people die. Jesus rose again, we believe, but 100% of people die. But this, this, what, what Paul's saying is, no, 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 Jesus, Jesus is eternal. And we could spend the next 20 minutes expounding on those two truths. Those are, what? I can't even fathom that. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on and he says that everything in all creation that was made was made through Jesus. Everything. What, is he, what does he mean by that? What, what does he mean that everything that has been made was made through Jesus? I think he means exactly what he says, that everything that has been made was made through Christ. So he makes it clear, hey man, anything you can see, anything that's visible, it was made through Jesus. Everything invisible, laws of gravity, all these things, it was made through Jesus. Every authority that's been established has been established by Jesus. Everything that was created was created by him, which makes Jesus really, really, really big. I think about that. Everything. Everything that was made. Not only that, it says that Jesus holds it all together. 
So see, see the profound truth that's, that's nestled in this text. It's this, that there is no thing or circumstantial issue that you're dealing with that is outside the grasp of our great Christ. But there's also nothing too small that slips through his fingers. He holds it all together. Everything. This last week I started thinking about, man, like, yeah, like the trees outside. Jesus, you made those? I started thinking about all the like the biggest things that I could think of. I want you to like think about it for a second. What is the biggest thing you can fathom right now? For some of you that have never left Baytown, you're thinking Fred Hartman Bridge. It's pretty big. It's a big thing. Some of you that are Texan through and through, you're like, well, it doesn't get bigger than Texas. You know, or Bucky's. Bucky's is big. That, that's a big thing. Mount Everest, maybe. Maybe you're thinking like, Mount Everest, that's pretty big. And, and don't get me wrong, those are pretty incredible things. I mean, Bucky's, that's incredible. And, and, and this is awesome. And then Jesus is sovereign over all of that. But, but this says that he threw him everything that was made that was made. So I started trying to think of the biggest thing that I could think of. And when I was thinking about the biggest thing that I could think of, the thing that I thought of was the sun. That's a pretty big thing. All right, here, here's a satellite image of the sun. Chances are you've never seen the sun like this, and if you have, it probably burned a hole in your cornea so you can't see me right now, right? Because you're not supposed to look into the sun unless you wear those weird glasses every 10 years or something like that. But this is what the sun looks like through a satellite image. The sun's big, but it's also pretty crazy. I, mean, I, I was looking this up this last week. The, the sun burns at 9,941 degrees Fahrenheit. So how fast can you cook a pizza on the sun? I'm not willing to find out. <laughs> it's pretty hot. And not, not only is it just super hot, it's huge. It's huge. I think we have this picture. This, this shows the sun next to Earth, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. Notice you can't even see Earth here. You can't even see. It's, it's a tiny little dot right there. Catch this. You can fit one are one million Earths inside of the sun. One million. As I try to process through that, like everything that we know, everything that we see, everything we experience, you can fit a million of those in the sun. Like I can't even, I can't even count to a million without the help of a calculator. That's amazing. What's crazy is the sun isn't even the largest star in our galaxy. In fact, there's a star that's way, way, way bigger than the sun in our galaxy called the VY Canis Majoris. There's a picture of VY. It's pretty staggering. We have, we have a picture of, of this star next to our sun, and you can kind of see a similar thing where you can't even see our sun next to this ginormous, to borrow the words of Buddy the Elf, this ginormous star in our galaxy. You can fit a hundred million Earths inside the sun, and then you can't even see the sun next to it. What? And see this. What Paul's saying here is, through Jesus, everything was made. This makes Jesus pretty great. I mean, pretty vast, pretty, pretty crazy big, like beyond most of our understanding. No, I would say beyond all of our understanding, we can't fathom the bigness of our Jesus. But Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say that he's big. He's not some cosmic creator that set everything and forget it like an easy bake oven. No, no, no. He says that Jesus is intricately involved in the inner workings of what's going on. Follow with me. Continuing on in chapter 1, starting in verse 18, Paul says this. He says, and he, being Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. See this? He is, he's leading our church. That's pretty staggering for us believers. It says he is, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. See this, the text Paul says here, not only was Jesus before all things, 
Paul makes a really bold claim, and this claim separates Christians from every other major world religion and everyone else in here. Everyone can kind of get behind a creator God. Everyone can kind of fathom that. But where Paul goes with this, many people are unwilling to follow in that he says, not only was Jesus the firstborn of all creation, no, 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 no. Jesus was the firstborn of the dead. In other words, what he's saying here is that we don't serve a Savior that came and died. We serve a Savior that got up out of the tomb. That that we serve a God. Dr. Adam Greenway put it this way. He said, we don't serve a Savior that came and died. We serve a Savior that died and lived. And that's the supreme hope of Christians. But it goes on to say this. It goes on to say that, that through him... God was pleased to dwell. God was pleased to dwell. I mean, think about that. It pleased God to be here. I don't know, I don't know about you. There are some days that I'm very pleased to wake up in Baytown, Texas. There are some days that I wonder why I didn't wake up in Florida. You know, or, or Colorado. Something like that. See, God, God, not only does it say that he dwelt among us in Jesus, the text says that not only he, did he dwell among us, that it pleased him to dwell among us. God was pleased in leaving heaven and coming to earth in Jesus. Why? Why was God pleased to dwell? Why, why did God choose to come here? And I think, I think we see this in verses 20 through 22. It says, He was pleased to dwell, in in verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Why was he pleased to leave heaven and come to earth? Why did it please God to come and dwell among us, broken people, dealing with sin and all kinds of issues, all of us? Why did it please him? It pleased him because in his coming and in his dying and in his resurrection, Jesus us resurrected us from our death and from our sin we have reconciliation to the father through the son have you ever wondered why jesus had to die ever wondered that i i have and i'm a christian i had skeptics in the room have to wonder like why if jesus was god then why did he die he did not have to die he could have lived right that that's a fair question why did jesus have to die why why did he come and why did he die look at verse 22 22 tells you really clearly why jesus came there's a bunch of reasons but verse 22 tells us that he died see this he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death In other words, why did Jesus die? Jesus died to reconcile us. Jesus died to bring us to God. That we can be brought near to him through Jesus. Yesterday, I got to to attend a wedding ceremony. And I love weddings. I know some of you in here are bah humbugs and you hate weddings because you're antisocial or you don't like to dance or you, you don't like to dress up. I don't know. You hate weddings. Whatever. I love weddings. I love them. They're fun. I don't know. I don't know what it is. You know, I don't know if it's the free food at the reception or what. But I, 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 love, I love going to weddings. And yesterday, I got to go to a wedding. And not, not, not just go to a wedding, I got to officiate this wedding. It was, it was a really pretty, small, quaint wedding. Um, and, and this couple's story is, is similar uh, to many of your stories. But what made this wedding unique was that it was this couple's second time to marry one another. It was, it was their second time to get married to one another. Um, and, and they called me, and I, I'd kind of known their story a little bit, but they called me uh, several weeks ago and asked me if I would be willing to, uh, to do this. And they just sort of shared their story with me. And, and their story, like I said, is similar to many of ours. 
They, they actually met in high school. They fell in love in college. They got married, and they're doing their thing. They're both working. They have two kids together, and, and life is going really well. But over time, they just started having conflict that they weren't able to resolve. And over, as months turned to years, there, there kind of became a wedge, and he was trying to fix her, and she was trying to fix him, and those of us that are married in the room know that that fixing doesn't work. And, and over time, they, they separated, which then led to a legal divorce. And, and it was hard. They, they were trying to follow Jesus, but, and they knew what Jesus said about divorce, but they, they also just couldn't figure out a way to make this thing work. They, they just couldn't do it, and so finally they, they divorced. And they, they were trying to figure out how to raise kids amicably, you know, like how, how to get along for the kids. They, they, they were trying to also follow Jesus individually. And then God started doing something inside of them. And, and God started reconciling them to himself. The, the, wife, the wife told me, she said, I just wasn't aware of some brokenness and just junk in my life. And the guy, the guy too, he's like, yeah, me too. Like, this is just where I was. And, and God started reconciling them to himself. And over time, God reconciled them together, culminating in yesterday, them standing before their friends and their boys and saying, we want to covenant together under Jesus. We know that Jesus is the only way our marriage is going to work. Like, that, that's it. And we, we want to covenant together under Jesus. We want, to, we want to make this commitment before you all and before our boys that we want to be married. And see this. God was able to reconcile two sides that seemed irreconcilable. He, he brought two people together that, that had hostility and anger and brokenness and all these things. They couldn't make it happen, but see this. They were able to be reconciled. And I don't say this to pour shame on anyone that's gone through the difficulty of divorce or, or is processing through this right now. I'm, not, I'm also not saying that this should be everyone's story. I'm not saying that at all. The reason why I'm illustrating this today is because I want you to see what that word reconcile means. Whenever the text says that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, he reconciled us to God, the picture that's being painted here is that there were two completely separated individuals. That we were completely separated from God and we had no hope of being reunited in God. But it pleased our great God to come here. It pleased our God to pursue us, to send his son Jesus, so that in Christ, if you place your faith in Jesus, see what the text says. The text says that you are made holy and blameless before him. Don't miss the weight of that. You are made blameless. I mean, how many, how many in here know the depth of your own sin? I can tell you, pastor does. I know the depth of my own sin, and it staggers me to think that because of Jesus, God does not look down on me and see sin or sinner. God looks down on me and sees Jesus' righteousness. He looks down and sees the blood of Jesus. See this. Jesus is, according to the Scriptures, the greatest of all time. Why is he the greatest of all time? Because Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose again and he did it for you. He did it for you and he did it for me. And hear this, Christians. It's so easy for Christians to hear this and to check out. For, for us to hear this, this idea, the good news of Jesus, and to check out. But I believe as, as believers especially, we need to check in. 
We need to check into this. We need to see the greatness of our Christ. We need to see the truth that we have been reconciled to the Father because of the Son. Because see this, we're going to walk through Colossians, and we're going to see how we are to change our lives and how we're to live on mission. We're going to see eventually that because he came, we go. We're going to see that, but we can't see that until we see that Jesus is the greatest. Jesus is the greatest of not just his century. Jesus is not just the greatest of the Middle East. No, no, no. Jesus is the greatest of all time. And it's not just because of who he is, though it is because of who he is. It's also because of what he's done. Jesus is the greatest. So I want to circle back around to the very first question that I gave you this morning. Who do you believe that Jesus is? Who do you, who do you believe that Jesus is? See, because I, I, I believe that this morning it's, it's, it's really easy for us to check out at this point, and I think we need to check in. Because it's so easy for those in here that maybe follow Jesus or don't follow Jesus, I think there's one of three ways that we can respond to him. The very first one is to deny him. Say, no, you know, like, I don't, I don't know about that yet. If that's you, that's okay. Keep coming with questions. You're welcome here. You're welcome. We want you to bring your questions. We want you to to bring anything that you have. We, We want you to know you're welcome here. But hear this, even for Christians, one way of disobedience that oftentimes we walk in is by believing him in our hearts but denying him with our lives that's not what Jesus called us to one one way we can respond is to deny him second response to Jesus is to denigrate him right to lower him to maybe a shell of 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 what he is say you know what I can really get down with some of Jesus' moral teachings, you know, the ones that, like, don't rub me the wrong way. You know, like, I I can do that, but these over here, let's put those in a box. Not going to have it. You know, I, I, I really like Jesus as a teacher. I really like that. I really like what Jesus has to say about this, but over here, this is mine. See this. If Jesus is who he says he was, Those first two responses are invalid. Third response today is for you and me to die to ourselves. See, Jesus said this in Luke 9. He said, if anybody wants to come after me, he's got to deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. Too many of us believers like the idea of following Jesus. We're not actually willing to follow him. You know how we're going to change this area? Baytown, Mont Bellevue, Crosby, Highlands. What's going to change this area is going to be a gathering of believers that say, though none go with me, still I will follow. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to line my life up to this. I, Jesus, will you show me how to parent my kids? Because the Lord knows I don't know how. And I want to parent my kids like you would have me parent my kids. Jesus, would you help me love my wife or love my husband like, like you would have me do that because I want to I wanna bring my life into alignment with you. So where are you today? Who do you say that he is? And how is God moving in you? Here's what's about to happen. We're going to have a time where you can respond to the Lord. So in just a second, we're going to have prayer partners up here and prayer partners in the back. Hear this. If you don't know who Jesus is, we want to tell you more about him today. Don't leave today without knowing Jesus. But man, maybe maybe some of us, Jesus, we follow Jesus. We follow Jesus for a long time, but we haven't been obedient to him. And we need to kind of rededicate ourselves to him this morning. If that's you, respond to him in that. Maybe you know that God's been leading you to do this, but that is just really uncomfortable. Maybe you need to commit to doing that this week. Maybe you need to confess sin. Maybe you just need prayer over what's going on in your life. Maybe you just need to stand and sing, but whatever your response is, I want to encourage you to be boldly obedient to the greatest of all time. Would you, would you stand with me? Let's pray. And then you respond to the Lord. If you're a prayer partner, would you come forward? You can come in the front or my back right, your back left. Let's pray. Father, we love you. 
We thank you for your son. We thank you for your spirit. God, we ask that, that you would lead us in this moment. Father, we want to submit ourselves to you. We want to serve the greatest of all time. So Jesus, today, would you lead us into greater faithfulness and greater obedience? And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you respond to the Lord as he leads you?